Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. Agustino Fuentes. He's Professor of Anthropology at Princeton University. Last time we focused mostly on his books, Race, Monogamy and Other Lies They Told You, and Why We Believe, and today we're going to talk about patriarchy and its supposed origin. So, Dr. Fuentes, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Ricardo, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be on this show, which is a fantastic show. I, you know, anytime we can have a chat, it's good by me. <laughs> yeah, great. So, uh, let's start perhaps with a definition, because as with many other things in science, sometimes this is where people disagree to begin with. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. From the perspective of an anthropologist, what is patriarchy? So, for example, when you look across societies and you classify them as patriarchal or matriarchal, if that's the case, what kinds of features do you look to? Well, I, I think we, we should sort of think about what we really mean by patriarchy, right? Mm -hmm. You could talk about patriarchal or matriarchal societies where you sort of see descent and power um, following down male or female lines. But really, when we talk about patriarchy in this broad anthropological, or even the public sense, we're talking about a social system, right? Where men hold primary power, dominating in political leadership, social privilege, economic control, and the structuring of moral authority, right? So men hold primary power, they dominate in political leadership, social privilege, economic control, and the structuring of moral authority, right? That's that's, I think, a good sort of big overarching structure or definition of patriarchy. And, and I think there's no doubt that over the last few centuries, for sure, a majority of nations on the planet are structured as patriarchies. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea how long patriarchy has existed for? I mean, I'm getting into that question now. Yeah. We'll get into other sources of evidence. Uh, the people who are more evolutionarily binded, let's say, point to. But starting yeah. with that, because, I mean, I would guess that if we had good enough evidence that it has existed forever, then that would probably be a good source of evidence for people saying that it's natural. You know, right? Way. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have to be careful with natural, right? That whole yeah. term. So let, let's put that aside. We can come back to that. But sure. I think what's really interesting is given the definition, right, that I just offered, um, we can look to sort of historical records. So we can look at economic, um, political, um, social written records, and we can look in the recent past, but then we can also go to the archaeological record, right? If you look at, if you have a substantial archaeology of a town, a city, a civilization, a society, um, an organization, a group, you can look and find different kinds of, of, of patterns that reflect what I just defined as patriarchy, right? So if you do all that and, and you look around, um, the first archaeological evidence for differences or structures of this sort of centralized social, economic, and political dominance by men really shows up, I mean, with some clarity, I would say in the last four to 7,000 years in a couple places. There's been some recent really good work on the Iberian Peninsula, right? De España, Portugal, uh, in that area, in this time period, three, four, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 years ago, where you see a transition from burials and tombs not showing real gender distinctions or not showing these real hierarchical distinctions to the emergence of pretty clear both gender and hierarchy distinctions with men associated with these sort of dominant social, economic, and political positions. So, so we can see it emerge at least in a few places archaeologically in what I would call, for me at least, the very recent past. Right? That, that's a pretty recent past. Does that mean it didn't occur in deeper time? No. It just means that the evidence that we can assess it by shows up pretty recently. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, what we know archaeologically from uh, historical or prehistorical, in this case, hunter-gatherer societies, there's not good evidence yeah. that there might have been patriarchal systems there. No. So if you look at contemporary hunter-gatherers, there, there's a wide range, and that's very mm -hmm. problematic because contemporary hunter-gatherers are part of the contemporary world for the most part. Um, so you can see gender divisions and complex gender relations, but on average, um, uh, hunter-gatherer groups and our evidence of, you know, hunter-gatherer groups 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, 
show what we call material egalitarianism. Now that's not everyone's equal, there's no hierarchy. It means that materially, right? And what it looks like politically associated with those materials, there's not radical distinctions, right? And hierarchy, and there's not radical, or at least to us in the bones, there isn't clear divisions between what we would call males and females in the sense of, of diet or other positions that might reflect social or political hierarchy. So that was a very long answer, but the bottom line is the hunter gatherer groups in the recent past and the very distant past don't show us the kind of clear sort of evidence of, of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So let's get back into the idea that some people point to about the so-called, let's say, naturalness of patriarchy, because there are people, particularly the ones who are more evolutionarily minded, evolutionary psychologists, for example, that argue and they point to different sources of evidence that we're probably going to go through most of them here today. But uh, what do you think is, first of all, tell us what is the, their basic idea and what you think is wrong about it? So, so here, let me be very, very clear, because you mentioned one thing and then you corrected it, right? You said evolutionarily minded. Okay, I'm very evolutionary minded, right? I'm evolutionary. Yes. I work in that area. So certain threads or trends, right? And I think evolutionary psychology is a good example. But I would say that broadly, there is an assumption from sort of some mainstream Darwinian approaches that patriarchy or males as the center of political, economic, and social dominance in a society has its roots, right? in deep evolutionary trajectories from the animal kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's an assumption. Let me actually read you a few quotes that just that, that do the perfect job of this, right? Sort of laying okay. this out, why this is, then I'll talk a little bit about them. So mm -hmm. the, the, um, here's Charles Darwin, right? 1871, a descent of man and sexual selection in relation to sex. Man is more courageous, pugnacious, and energetic than woman and has more inventive genius. And goes on to sort of say how that pans out. E.O. Wilson, right? Uh, Edward Wilson in Sex and Human Nature, 1979, wrote, and here I quote, the average temperamental differences between the human sexes are also consistent with the generalities of mammalian biology. Women as a group are less assertive and physically aggressive. The physical and temperamental differences between men and women have been amplified by culture into universal male dominance, right? That was Wilson in 79. Uh, and and uh, finally, uh, on a in an article, a very prominent article called The Evolutionary Origins of Patriarchy, uh, Barbara Smuts wrote, and I quote, the ultimate goal of patriarchy is control over female reproduction and the ultimate sanction to achieve this goal is violence. The evolutionary perspective also reminds us that patriarchy is a human manifestation of a sexual dynamic that is played out over and over again in many different ways in other animals, right? And I could go on, but you can see the basic argument is that we have anisogamy in the animal world, uh, which leads to, particularly in mammals, differential investment, not just in gametes, but in uh, reproduction and care of young by males and females, which leads to different trajectories of evolutionary psychology and physiology and behavioral ecology for males and females. And the argument by some is that these differences set the stage for a male dominance or a male-centered political economic control and a female-centered cooperative care family control. And that that then expands in more recent human history into what we call patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is a point that we'll probably return to later on in the interview, but I guess that, of course, we can't deny that any of those people you mentioned are I mean, have done great work in evolutionary biology I, and elsewhere, I, but that, absolutely. that already points to perhaps one of the issues here, that is, even though they were great scientists, they were still under the influence of their own culture, right? And, and that's, that's actually this really interesting thing because, and we can, you know, hopefully talk a bit about this, you know, contemporary biology, contemporary genomics, contemporary understandings of evolutionary histories, right, really say that it's not that simple, that there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, right? And we can talk specifically about human evolution. But the way those phrases laid out, right, you can see how the scientists, the excellent scientists, were not just talking about the data, right? They were interpreting them in particular ways that were shaped, right? Uh, by particular societal expectations and understandings. And, I, I, and that's 
in the conversation about patriarchy, that's very important because what we want to do really is sort of try, we all have our political and philosophical opinions, but, but there are a lot of data relative to this. And so the best we can stick to the data, right, uh, and, and understand the different interpretations, the better. So yeah, I, I think that's, that's very important. Um, and we can talk about a lot of this different data, but I will say that there, there's many in the sort of evolutionary world, and as you noted, especially in evolutionary psychology, that basically are using Wilson's and um, uh, Darwin's basic notions. Um, they, they, and, and you know, probably Smut's notion too, that it's the sex differences, the biology of evolved differences between what we're gonna call male and female within a given species that underlie the naturalness, as you said, of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And what are the main sources of evidence that they usually point to, to argue that or, or for the naturalness of patriarchy? Right. So, so the critical argument here is sort of patriarchy is this one emergence, right? So Wilson and Smuts clearly say it emerges from this animal nature, right? This sort of what this standard thing. So what is that standard thing? Well, it starts uh, obviously um, with, with Darwin's notions of, of male-female differences in the uh, in sexual selection and uh, selection in relation to sex. Um, the idea that there are different factors, environmental processes of selection on males and females, um, which is, you know, extended up into the early part of, let's say, the um, 20th century, where we get, um, for example, Bateman doing the work on fruit flies and arguing and demonstrating, uh, at least initially, this, this work has been criticized in many ways, but initially that large gamete, uh, what we call females, and small gamete, what we call males, individuals are investing differently uh, in, in, in reproductive processes. So that, that's the core evidence, right? And then the, that ratchets up by the 60s and 70s, you get W.D. Hamilton, Robert Trivers, uh, and eventually then uh, Edward Wilson sort of doubling down on this and saying, okay, if the gamete difference investment and reflects this broader difference in investment between males and females in reproduction, then we can use mathematical models to predict sort of how these differences are gonna ramp out and then go back and look at the world and test these models and see if they fit, right? So. I'm gonna cut to the end of the story here. It turns out the models fit in some species, in some lineages and don't fit in others. And so it's actually a lot more complicated than gamete size, which Bateman, some of his initial work was actually wrong and that's been demonstrated lately. But, but also the statistical models, for example, of Trivers and parental investment, those are based on a series of assumptions that don't always hold up. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So as with most biological things, like the system's a little bit more messy than most people originally thought. Mm -hmm. By the way, before we get into features of human societies that uh, they say are supposedly universal, but that's also mm -hmm. questionable as we'll talk about. Uh, but before that, just talking about the, the, any, the uh, other animal models. We have like, yeah. other great apes like chimpanzees, bonobos, etc. To what extent do, do you think we should compare ourselves to them? Because, of course, there's biological yeah. continuity, so to some extent, at least, we should do it. But, I mean, at the, at the same time, I mean, th that's one question, but the other question is that uh, many assumptions that have been made about the behavior of chimpanzees and bonobos probably are not uh, right. Correct. Yeah, I mean, so here's the, the great thing, right? So um, evolution is about continuities and discontinuities, right? So the continuities right. help us understand the big picture, the universal patterns, these dramatic sort of evolutionary trajectories. But the discontinuities help us understand each lineage, right? Because we define, right? How do we define a human? It's by our evolutionary separation from others, right? Um, so, so yeah, we'll, we'll get into both of those things. I think what's really important here, though, is when we talk about patriarchy and we're talking about its sort of potential evolutionary bases, we need to recognize that humans are mammals, so mammalian biology is central, right? Then humans are primates, so primate twists on mammalian biology and social ecology are central. Then we need to remember that humans are hominins, right? And so each level up, we're sort of thinking more specifically with that. But, but as you said, I mean, people love to go to the chimpanzees, for example. I, I, you know, they're our closest relatives. They may not always be the best examples to compare humans, but but let's just sit with that um, for a moment. 
And the problem with chimpanzees is, right, there are multiple pan species, right, or at least there's multiple species of pan troglodytes, and then there's pan paniscus, or depending if you want, there may be multiple species within the trag troglodytes cluster. The bottom line is there's actually a lot of variation behaviorally, um, substantial variation ecologically, but not a huge amount of variation morphologically uh, in, in the genus pan, relatively speaking. So it's very interesting with, with the same bodies, right? These different species or groups or subspecies, what have you, of chimpanzees are doing pretty different things. That's actually, for me, sort of the hallmark of a lot of the primates. Primates take this basic mammalian biology and have really tweaked it, especially reproductively and socially in fascinating ways, right? Gibbons, titi monkeys, macaques, uh, the entire range of apes, you know, gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans do very different kinds of things uh, with, with their bodies. So, so I think it's, we can learn a lot about commonalities and differences, but also about flexibilities. So if anything, when I look to the chimpanzees, the, the entirety of the pan species, I'm like, wow, they're doing a lot of different kind of complex social behavior with more or less the same morphology. And even if we take chimpanzees as the best model for the evolutionary basis of our behavior and even sex differences and all of that, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem to me that we should classify chimpanzee societies as patriarchal, right? Mm, because well, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, the, the females there seem to hold lots of power yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could, I think I could, I think we could make a sociological argument that Eastern chimpanzees, right? Pan, troglodytes, Schweinfurtii, show at least in some areas, Gombe, in, um, uh, in uh, Kabali, I mean, in, in some of the different major study sites show these sort of male-centered social structures, mm, right? Okay. Uh, where, where, where males are using coercion, right? To sort of politically uh, and socially dominate other males and females. So you can see some, some correlates of male-centered control in okay. these social groups. Um, in these communities. Um, but, but then a, as you move out to some of the other subspecies or other species of chimpanzee, you see a lot of variation there, right? If you go all the way to the Western chimpanzees, you see that sort of, that, that sort of male-female relationships are a little bit more dynamic, um, not as, as clear cut. And also the group structure, the community structure seems to be a little different. And then in Panpaniscus, you get a very radically different sort of uh, social structure. So I think at the end of the day, what you're saying is accurate that chimpanzees don't give us one picture of this, right? They give us a, a, a variety of different ones. Um, what they do show is that with a particular body form, you can get a huge range of sort of sexual relationships, social structures, and ecological dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, so going back to human societies, what is the idea of the nuclear family? And why do you think it is important to address this topic when talking about patriarchy? Well, I mean, so, you know, one of the, the assumptions, right? And I mean, there's a lot more that we could talk about the biology and stuff, but you're right, we've, that, that's been done. Um, I, I think one of the most important things about the sort of nuclear family is this assumption, and, and many have held this, that, that say uh, the heterosexual pair bond, a male and a female and their reproductive output, right? Their offspring forms the sort of nucleus, right? Nuclear, right? The, the, the center of, of human evolution. Um, but Actually, if you look at the uh, sort of fossil and archaeological record, we, we don't see an enormous amount of data to support one male, one female, plus offspring, central residence or central grouping, right? It looks like multi-male, multi-female, plus offspring are the sort of standard groups up until extremely recently, right? When we can actually document residence patterns. Now, that doesn't mean that pair bonding is not important. We can talk a lot about pair bonding mm -hmm. because clearly pair bonding is central to humans. But pair bonding does not equal monogamy. Pair bonding does not equal nuclear family. There, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. I, I think it's important to note that even in contemporary humans, right, when we think of the nuclear family, we think of that as a baseline, but that's actually not true, right? Um, really good work has been done on this. And Rebecca Sear has published a number of articles that reviewed extensive social and biological literatures sort of, and demographic data that showing that contemporary humans do, right, form, a, and here I'll quote her, they have a tendency to form pair bonds between individuals who work together to raise children 
And there is a tendency for women to devote more time to child rearing than men in these relationships. But, and I quote again, these pair bonds are not always lifelong. They're not always exclusive. They're not necessarily co-residential, and they don't necessarily involve only the parents of the children, nor are the children always raised by their own parents. So um, greater emphasis on child rearing among women and these different residence patterns does not mean exclusive uh, female domesticity or male sort of uh, economic thing, nor does it mean that or indicate that this sort of nuclear family is the main residence. So again, that's, sorry, a very long answer, but the bottom line is the fossil and archaeological evidence and the contemporary evidence, and this most people, if they look around the world, realize, recognize that the nuclear family is just not the basal way in which humans organize themselves. Mm -hmm. By the way, by contemporary human societies, you're also including their industrialized and post-industrial yes. yeah. societies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Even in that, so if you look around, for example, here in the United States, there's this sort of just broad scale assumption that nuclear families are the primary residence pattern. But in fact, extended families um, are, are quite common. And if you look around the world, I mean, in Portugal, you know, the vast majority of people live in some version, right, of extended or, or expansive network families. Um, and that's characteristic of the world. Um, even though we now tend to build in the contemporary landscape, uh, particularly the developed world, um, single residence homes, right? So what we call single family homes or apartments, but that's not usually who lives there. Yeah. And even from an evolutionary perspective, I mean, we know there's lots of evidence, not only from contemporary societies, but also from historical ones that uh, we've had lots of cooperative breeding yeah. in our evolutionary yeah, no history. And, and this, this is, if you don't mind me deviating here a little bit, this is actually related to the family. We can come back to pair bonds, but cooperative breeding is really important in talking about patriarchy, right? Because one of the assumptions of patriarchy, if, if it's an evolutionary sort of outcome of, of, of human evolutionary trajectories, right? One of the assumptions is that men can take this sort of social, political, and economic power because women are constrained uh, by uh, child birth by child care and sort of the, the costs of a reproduction in children. But here's where uh, similarities and dissimilarities in evolution become very important, right? So there's this mammalian trend, right? Where females care for infants and males don't, it's a trend. Now, that is not universal amongst mammals. There's actually a huge range of variation, but let's, let's just say that's the trend. But when we look at humans, humans have had to tackle a bunch of weird things that is human, our lineage specifically has very large uh, brains uh, and very big bodies and a very extended childhood to, to sort of make and enable that nervous, psycho, cognitive, physiological system to, to mature. Um, and I think there's robust evidence that you just mentioned that, um, look, a cooperative caretaking system evolved in humans, right? That is human physiology, neurobiology and behavior became modified sometime in the early to middle Pleistocene such that caretaking is not the job of a single individual. So the costs on individual women for reproduction are actually distributed. That's one of the huge evolutionary, I think, innovations in, in the lineage of the genus Homo. And because of that, um, you can't say that um, the costs on a, you can't model costs on a single female versus costs on a single male in the genus Homo. That's not an evolutionary relevant way to talk about the human niche for at least a good chunk of the Pleistocene. And, and I'll shut up in a moment, but you know, there's actually a recent paper suggesting this pattern might actually be found in the Australopithecines even earlier than the genus Homo. So, so I think it's, there's an interesting hominin thing going on here, maybe with cooperative caretaking. So tell us a little bit more about pair bonding then. What does it really mean? In humans. So I, I don't know if you know this or if anyone knows this, but that was like, that was sort of my dissertation work. And that was my first big contribution is, you know, I went out to study a pair bonded monogamous langur monkey, right? Um, I went out, I knew all about pair bonds. I knew about monogamy. I knew about its evolutionary backgrounds. I get to the field and yes, these langurs, these monkeys are living primarily in one male, one female plus option group, not exclusively, but primarily, but they're not behaving like they do. That is, they don't pay any attention to each other. They don't interact. They don't do any of these like pair bond things that I was expecting. So that led me to sort of do a giant survey over 20 years ago of, of all the pair bonded primates. And, and what emerged was that there's not one thing called a pair bond. 
right? There's sexual pair bonds that, that can be monogamous for a season or for long periods of time. There are social pair bonds that are these incredibly high level energetic and social investment in one another that may or may not have sexual components. Um, and then there's pair bonds uh, that, that flux over time. So there's a whole bunch of psychological and physiological and behavioral things that we call pair bonds. But what's important for humans is that we seem to be physiologically and behaviorally sort of adapted to very tight relationships. Can be more than one, can involve sex or not involve sex, but the incredible power of human bonding is there. And so humans do form pair bonds. Um, they can form multiple, they can be heterosexual or homosexual, they can involve sex or not involve sex, but they're at the center of a lot of human evolutionary dynamics, but they don't, they don't actually tell us much about patriarchy or nuclear families or things like that. And I think this is a very important point to make here. So pair bonding does not mean at all monogamy, correct? No, 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 you can, no, it can, right? You could have mm -hmm. a sexual and a social pair bond that are very tight. So humans are um, frequently monogamous in some ways, um, but, uh, you know, sexually, if you look at all the data that are available, um, it's pretty clear that, that, humans experience multiple sexual partners uh, across the lifespan and that their sexualities vary pretty, you know, dramatically in and between populations. So um, humans have lots of sex, like way more than almost all other mammals and all other primates. And they do so in very complex ways. Sometimes that's related to these pair bond relationships. Sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. By the way, having a monogamous or a polygamous mating system, does one of the other correlate more or less with patriarchy? Or it's funny because both have been argued to, to sort of underlie patriarchy. Yeah, that's right? why which, I'm which, asking you, which, because there's yeah. been arguments made for yeah. both sides. So. I, I think shows the weakness of that argument, right? So, so the, the one argument is that monogamy, right, is a central characteristic of patriarchy because monogamy has assumed to entail role differentiation between males and females, where males are taking this sort of political outward facing economic role and females are taking the internal caretaking role. Um, uh, but we know that it's not that simple. It's definitely not true for humans. There's much more complexity. So it's not monogamy. Monogamy does not underlie patriarchy. So one could then argue, and this has happened, Bobby Lowe and others have made this argument that, that polygamy, right, indicates patriarchy. That is, one male dominating access to multiple females or reproducing way more than other males shows a difference in male hierarchical power. Right. Um, and that sounds very good. However, you have to look at in an evolutionary sense within and across populations, are there biological characteristics, inheritable characteristics of these males who do very well, who are kings or Genghis Khan or whatever, um, that leave lots of offspring? It turns out no, right? You know, being an offspring of Genghis Khan, which many, many people are, doesn't benefit you in any way at this point. You didn't inherit some biological gene of cool, dominant maleness. Uh, so what's really interesting is that we have a history of humans of different polygyny, polygamy, a little bit of polyandry, monogamy as systems, but they're flexible and variable over time. And they don't seem to correlate with specific economic and political outcomes. I mean, they don't correlate universally with specific political and economic outcomes. Mm -hmm. So getting now into morphological features or, and anatomy, are there any morphological correlates that point to, in any way, male dominance or male group leadership? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and, and that's something that's really interesting. You know, I've written, written on this recently, published in a couple of different places, and I think it's very important that Let's, you know, you can do the mammalian wide thing, but that gets very difficult. So let's stick to primates, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out there are some primate species that have what we would call pretty clear male dominance measured in priority of access to resources, right? That, mm -hmm. that, that males are able to supplant other males and most females in, uh, in order to access the desired resources. That's sort of the definition that we tend to use for, for dominance in this case. Um, there are also other species where males appear to use kind of coercion on occasion, or at least some males to gain sexual access uh, to females. And so we could argue that those are male dominant, right, in, in, by those mm -hmm. definitions. Um, so there are uh, patterned uh, morphological characteristics, uh, male size uh, favored dimorphism. That is, uh, in most of these species that have these clear, like measurable dominance patterns of males, they tend to be 25% or larger, 50, 100% larger than females. Um, uh, so that there's a massive physical difference. Um, they 
when they're not massively larger or 50%, 25% larger, they tend to have much, much larger canine teeth, um, much larger canine teeth. And that's been argued to have emerged through male-male competition. It might have also emerged through sort of just this pattern of male dominance over, you know, r regardless, this sort of male competition with everyone. Um, so big bodies, big canine teeth. And there's a few other uh, uh, correlates um, are, are consistent. What's really interesting is we don't see these exact same consistencies in some of the endocrine profiles, right? You would think, oh, it's always testosterone or things like that actually doesn't pan out clearly. Um, but the big body size and the big canines are consistent in male dominant, for the majority of male dominant species. Now, not all big males in, in small female species have the same kind of dominance relationship, but, but it is more common. Mm -hmm. But in humans specifically, how sexually dimorphic are we in terms of So, uh, you know, uh, Lassick and Gowlin, th there's a number of evolutionary psychologists who argue that humans are really sexually dimorphic. But, you know, as someone who looks at primates writ large, mammals writ large, um, you know, humans are really not that sexually dimorphic. We're about 10 to 15 percent dimorphic in size with actually about 78 percent overlap in body size within a population. So there's a lot of flux there. Um, what's really interesting about dimorphism in humans is that on average, uh, what we're going to call 3G sex males, that is males that have, you know, testes, uh, XY um, and, and uh, uh, external genitals, penis and scrotum, um, that sort of category also tend to have um, higher muscle density and muscle mass in the upper body primarily. So, uh, you know, 3G males tend to be about 30 to 40 percent uh, stronger in the upper body uh, than 3G females. Now, the problem is males and females train very differently in a lot of human societies because of gender roles and those things. So that explains some of it, but not all of it, right? There's differences in muscle density. So there is some interesting upper body differences, um, but as far as sexual dimorphism relative to all of the mammalian or primate species that show clear male dominance, we're just, we're just not there. I mean, we look more like gibbons uh, or chimpanzees for that matter, who have some sexual dimorphism. Uh, more than us uh, than we do any other species. So if you want to explain male-female relations in humans based on body size and sexual dimorphism, you're not going to find very much. Mm -hmm. uh, what about other kinds of sex differences people usually point to, like, for example, capacities or patterns in tool making and use and starting with the evidence we have from the Pleistocene? The evidence we have for the Pleistocene for gender differences or biological sex differences in tool use is absolutely zero. There's none, right? That doesn't mean it didn't happen, but there's no evidence that making old making Oldowan, Acheulean, Levalois technologies, uh, blade technologies, all of that stuff up until very recently, which I'll get to in a moment, but all of the evidence we have for actually making stone and other tools um, doesn't mandate any, um, there's no difference in biological form from the fossil record or contemporary humans that clearly relates to some different pattern. So that was, again, a very long way to say this, but we have no evidence for gendered or biological sex differences in tool making or use in the fossil record. Now, people argue, but yeah, but men, males, 3G males, right, even in the fossil record are dimorphic. They're slightly larger, probably with a little bit of upper body strength relative to females. So right. like maybe in taking big spears and sticking them into things, that might have made a difference. One of the problems here is that a majority of fossil members of the genus Homo, especially, you know, if we compare 100,000 years ago, 70,000 years ago, two, three, four, 500,000 years ago, both males and females, that is all of these individuals are more robust than we are today. So, so we're not comparing, we're not talking about current humans in the past. We're talking about a more sort of robust group of individuals. And so what does that difference really mean? We don't really know what that is. So again, I keep answering this very, very <laughs> extendedly, but the bottom line is we don't have any really good indication for tool difference until the Holocene until recently, until the advent and widespread use of agriculture and particular weapons that require upper body, uh, that favor upper body strength.
Mm -hmm. But if we found differences, shouldn't we expect them to follow patterns of sexual division of labor? I mean, like, for example, the idea that, again, I'm not sure if it's supported by the evidence or not, that, for example, when it came to hunting, it was mostly done by males. So, so we would expect, right, looking at some mm -hmm. contemporary things. Now, two things here in that, um, and, then, and then I'll go back to some interesting what looks like gender differences that we do have. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, hunting, most human evolution, right? Most of human evolution is not characterized by big game hunting. Most populations, most groups did not do big game hunting. Now that we, we think of that as really impressive. That's not actually how most food throughout most of human history has been gathered. Now, there are some groups and particularly in the last three, four, five hundred thousand 500,000 years, we did see organization of social groups and some real advent in large game hunting. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't always just running up and sticking the stuff with short spears. There was a wide variety of different ways, chasing things off cliffs, doing different things. So, so yes, in some cases, in some populations, there probably was preference for male biased hunting, right? Um, but that's not ubiquitous across the species. Um, secondly, there's recent evidence of female hunters, at least in the terminal Pleistocene and early Holocene, right? That's been published. Um, so, so again, because females were larger than they are today, as we're all you know, more robust and muscular uh, as most uh, of, of uh, earlier humans were, it, it's hard to do the comparison today, right? But let's set that aside and say that, yeah, of course, in some contexts, it may have favored larger upper body strength, may have favored a division of, of labor, right? In some groups, that's just not ubiquitous across all of humans. Now, what's really interesting is that we do find what looks like some at least sex biology and probably gender differences uh, in the fossil record, but they're weird, right? So for example, in, in a couple different Neanderthal sites, we find not, we find some difference in breakage patterns, like where bones are being broken in bodies we assigned to male and female, but not that much. So it looks like they're overlapping a lot. And here again, uh, Rebecca Rag Sykes' work is fantastic. I, I recommend everyone read her book, Kindred, which is spectacular overview of this. But, um, but a, a bunch of data have been published on Neanderthals on tooth wear. And it turns out in some of these populations where we have multiple males and females, not a ton, but, but more than one of each, um, it looks like there's tooth wear patterns on both the crania we call male and the crania we're calling female, but the wear patterns are slightly different. One are beveled in and the others are beveled out on the teeth. That, that probably means they're doing different kinds of things with their teeth regarding to furs or skin or something. They're doing different jobs with their teeth. So that suggests some kind of differentiation. But, but I don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. And it doesn't map to like hunting versus not hunting, probably. There's other things going on. So there's not to say that there weren't role differentiations deeper in time. It's just that they don't map to our clear notions uh, of distinction. And I think the best way to show that is our earliest evidence of graves, right? Uh, when they show up with multiple individuals with goods within them, right, in the last 30, 40,000 years, um, we just don't really see this differentiation based on sex or even based on ability or age that comes much more recently in the last four to five, six, seven thousand years. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, you touched on that, but let me ask you directly. So what about more recent evidence in the Holocene about tool making and use? Uh, do we find there any big uh, sex differences? So what's really fascinating is that when you look at the archaeological data available for the last, let's say, four to 6,000 years, um, when we start to see, you know, what we would call urban settlements, right, uh, mm -hmm. sort of agricultural settlements, and this is where we see it primarily, um, we see what looks like role differentiation around tool making. We don't know that it's all male-female role differentiation, but we tend to see specialists, right, mm -hmm. around certain things, and especially with different kinds of agricultural implements. Uh, plows or large scythes or different kinds of things. We're assuming that there's some physical differences uh, being mandated here. We're also seeing what looks like different kinds of residence patterns. And there is evidence of different sort of basically through isotope markers that those skeletons we're calling male and those skeletons we're calling female are eating slightly different things, maybe behaving a little bit differently. And so their bodies are processing the nutrients differently. So we're, we start to see evidence of sort of role differentiation. And then, as I said, as particularly in the Iberian Peninsula, but in other places, we start to see grave goods differences associated with bodies that we're calling male and female. Um, now, sometimes we mess up and we miscategorize those bodies and that's always interesting. But, um, 
but we do start to see role differentiation. And I will tell you in the last few thousand years, almost universally in humans, now universally in sort of large scale societies, societies that are either doing agriculture or large sort of urban or large village setups, uh, mm -hmm. we see clear role differentiation and many of that, much of that differentiation is long gendered lines. Mm -hmm. So with all of what we talked about, what is your general opinion about the hypothesis we have out there for explaining the supposed origins of patriarchy? You know, it's really complicated. And I've been thinking a lot about this. And, and when you pitch this idea to me to come and talk about it, you know, I've written a little bit on this, but I haven't written or haven't formalized the sort of big why question. I, I've written a bit about this um, because if you look at the world today, you can see patriarchy is a dominant, it's not the only, but it's, it's a dominant system, at least in the last three, four, five, six, seven hundred years, maybe longer. Um, given that, we need an explanation, right? There's got to be some reasons for this. It didn't just happen, right? Things don't right. just happen. Um, and, and then because archaeologically we see this emergence of role differentiation and the sort of centralization, at least in some cases of power, political and economic power with men, we have to ask why, right? Um, and I think, I don't think there's a single explanation. I think it's this really complicated, messy thing of a bunch of stuff going on. But I'll say it probably has to do with ex expanded role differentiation, gender role differentiation. Um, it has to do with, I think, restriction of some of the cooperative care. I think of more control of, of, of um, uh, reproduction because of increased material goods and inheritance. I think when goods are starting to be passed down and there's inequality in goods, there's more control about that inheritance patterns. And I think in many cases uh, that trends towards the sort of male control of inheritance uh, for a number of reasons. So I think there's a lot of things. I think inheritance, I think property, right? More material goods, inequity, all of those things come together combined with, right? Male size, right? the advent of the use of weaponry for conflict and warfare, weaponry that involves upper body strength, mm -hmm. um, spears, swords, things like that. Um, I think you put all of those things together and you provide an opening for patriarchy to start sort of evolving culturally, right? Ecologically in multiple places and sort of firming up. Because I think if you look around the world, patriarchy is not the same everywhere. It actually varies in, in what it looks like. And so I think all these sort of situations came together in a perfect storm a number of times. And, and that's why we see what we see today. Now, just this is just my musings. The problem is this is a messy model. We don't, I think, have a very good grasp on the diversity of early patriarchy. And that's, that's really where we need to look to find out how to explain contemporary patriarchy. Um, as far as an evolutionary origin. Mm -hmm. I think there's a social and political and economic reality going on right now that's self-fulfilling, right? I think patriarchy is a way in which business works in the world, right? It's the way political and economic systems are designed. And so they're going to keep trying to keep that going. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even if we don't have good enough evidence to really say definitely what might have been the origins of patriarchy, uh, do you think it would at least be safe to say or to assume that instead of thinking of patriarchy as some sort of given or natural aspect of our human, I mean, part of our human yeah. nature, um, that we should look at the conditions and factors, ecological, economic, societal, and elsewise, uh, that would give rise to patriarchy. That is the, the specific set of conditions that have to be set in place for patriarchy to arise, basically. Yeah, I, I 100%. I think that's exactly it. And then that's the challenge, right? How do we actually understand patriarchy? We have to go back and look at the archaeological, the social, political, the behavioral, the physiological. All of those things are coming together a couple different times in particular ways. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is. So I would not say patriarchy is from human nature, but obviously human nature provides the possibility of patriarchy, right? But that, that's, that's, that's the wrong way to ask about it. The way you just laid it out is what we should ask. We should ask, why is patriarchy so dominant today? Um, especially, and I think this is really interesting, 
because it looks like it doesn't work very well for most humans. So <laughs> even for men in many cases, right? Well, even for men. Yeah. I'm just saying <laughs> the contemporary patriarchal societies are incredibly hierarchical and incredibly yeah. unequal and benefit only very few in the sense of reproduction, nutrition, sort of access to resources. So it's very weird that a species so adept at social and that navigation of the world is now in a place where it just looks like the majority of individuals in that species are suffering because of the contemporary uh, socially dominant pattern. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the role of culture here? Because of course, the uh, patriarchal values are also culturally mm -hmm. transmitted, correct? No, they are culturally transmitted, right? I don't, I don't think you cannot maintain patriarchal political and economic systems or any political and economic systems without moral, ethical, cultural, historical shaping of the mindset and the perception, right? This is the way it should be. You have to have that. Otherwise, it isn't that way because there's, we could do all sorts of things. Um, so I would argue that the, the most important questions, if we're really interested in the origins of patriarchy, sort of the contemporary understandings of patriarchy, and I would say personally, how do we move beyond contemporary patriarchy into some other mode, right? And, and this is a long history, like anthropologists Ashley Montague and others have been arguing for this a long time. Um, uh, but I would say cultural dynamics in relation to bodies, ecologies, economies, and sort of the, the relationship between all those things, that's what the question is. So culture is the center. So I think we need more ethnography right? We need to understand how patriarchies actually are for people. Then we need to also understand like what's the pattern um, historically and in the contemporary moment for what patriarchy does to bodies and then think through that. How, how do these things work? So yeah, I, I think this is definitely centrally a question of cultural evolution and cultural dynamics in the current moment with, of course, uh, it's sort of a frame of understanding the sort of genus homo in our evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question for you that is more of a general one and going all the way back to when I asked you about uh, how scientists are influenced by their own culture and you mentioned Darwin, Wilson yeah. and Smuts, for example. So what, uh, what is your opinion about this? I mean, to what extent do you think scientists should be aware of their own uh, values, being them political, societal, whatever, religious, even sometimes. And uh, how careful should we be about bringing our own politics into the domain of science, for example? Well, you know, I've written about this and I've been resoundingly attacked for it in some ways, but I'm sticking to it. Um, the best science is a science that's fully aware of scientists versus science, right? That is, scientists are humans practicing methodology, interpreting, living in a social political world. I, just like everyone else, am biased. I'm horribly biased, right? But, but when I practice my science, my goal is to be like, okay, here's what I believe, here's what I want to be in the world, but, but let me try to understand what's out there and to sort of navigate that. And so uh, I think this is the, the best science is done in teams, is done by diverse teams. So people who are bringing different opinions and different experiences so that we can check one another. So we're not all just coming from the same background in the same context saying, well, this is the way the world is, of course. Because if we do that, if we're all the same, you know, if you get a group of folks together who have all pretty much the same lived experience, they're gonna look at a body of data and interpret it in one way. But if you bring together a group of folks with diverse experiences and backgrounds and context, they're gonna look at that same body of data and have different insights, different perceptions. So that's what's important. Now. The big challenge, and I'll try to do this quickly, is how do we then deal with the history of science and deal with the major theories and methods of people who we know were biased and we know are biased in some horrible ways, right? But yet made great contributions and shaped yeah. the way we think about it, right? So, you know, I wrote this thing about Darwin that everyone got all upset about. Darwin is one of my great heroes, but I also recognize the horrendous bias he had right? And how those played out in some of his theories all the way down to this day. That quote I read from him is an example of that. So how do you navigate that? You go back and read the original literatures, understand the contemporary histories, and then try to navigate what these incredible scholars, these incredible people actually contributed and unpack from their own biases, sort of those gems of knowledge. 
right? That's, that's what I hope. So, you know, in the future, I hope I contribute something to the world of science. And in the future, when people are reading my stuff, like, oh, that Augustine Fuentes, he was so biased in this way, but, but he had these really good ideas and we're gonna just take those ideas and move forward. And that's, that's the trick, right? How do we sort of take the good, contextualize the bad mm -hmm. and move forward as scholars, right? As scientists. And I, and I think diversity and teams and also a little bit of humility, recognizing that we're all sort of messed up as humans. That's what we do. And so take everything with a grain of salt, study, know your history and really, really, really follow the data. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something we also touched on last time, because uh, I think that last time I, I was also asking you about your chapter on a most interesting problem that edited yeah. book on the 150th anniversary of the publication of Descent of Man. And of course, I think that uh, it's not at all the case that just looking back at some perhaps racist and sexist ideas that Darwin espoused that were part of his culture back in the 19th century and some of them are even still part of our culture today. I mean, we don't need to completely ignore his entire body of work because that would be absolutely not. silly and the same would work for yeah. Wilson, Smuts and all yes. the others. But I, I mean, we have to take into account that also science is an evolving body of knowledge and what yesterday might have been taken for granted today is questionable. Right? Yeah, and I think that's especially important when we're talking about keystone human factors in our societies, sex, gender, right? Patriarchy, power, economic inequality and poverty, race and racism. Like those things are not, it's not like, wow, what is the shape of the metatarsal in the genus Homo and contemporary humans, right? Not, not that there's anything wrong with studying metatarsals, but just focusing on the structure of one bone is very different than asking a question about patriarchy, right? Or race or sex, you know? The, so, so certain topics <laughs> carry a little bit more of this biased weight and we have to just be more careful. But again, that's why generous, sincere intellectual engagement is important, recognizing the history, but as you said, recognizing that we know more now Right. So let's let's use that and, and let's not throw out the past, but let us understand the past in the contemporary moment. Great. So let's end on that note, then, Dr. Fuentes. And thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. Uh, by the way, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the Internet? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I am a Fuentes2 at Princeton.edu, right, is, is my yeah. email. If you have questions and people do email me all the time with that, I am uh, uh, at Anthro Fuentes on Twitter. Please follow me there and, and pepper me with all of your tweets and thoughts. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, read my work. Um, read the peer reviewed literature if you can. Uh, if you can't, I do a lot of blogs and popular books and things like that. And do this for everyone. Follow your favorite scholars on social media, but try at least every now and then to actually read some of their peer-reviewed scholarship because we say stuff on social media and in the public that's fascinating and quick, but we also actually do the work. And sometimes we really want people to look at the work as well. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And... Uh, thank you so much again for taking the time and it's always a big pleasure to talk to you. Thanks Ricardo, this is a wonderful show. Thank you so much for doing what you do. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, Please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. 
Karen Litz, Ken Blanchett, Perga, Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Herbert Ginti, Zoloff, Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Calenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegar, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavanagh, Jorge Pinha, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Nyars, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adez, Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stasevski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Simon Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Doug, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morton Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, Georgios Steofanis, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herrigman, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, D. RPMD and Eager N. And special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Vanagdam, Bernard Ugni, Curtis Dixon, Belnick Miller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz. And to my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.